It's my honor to stand before you this morning. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling good this Christmas, uh, physically, spiritually, just, um, I don't know, it looks like my awareness is heightened more than most seasons, most Christmases even this year about Jesus Christ. He came. It looks like with each, each passing day that, 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 that means more and more to me how thankful I am. How, how many thankful to know Jesus? How many thankful that he came for us, came for you? I'm going to move into Christmas a little bit more this year and this week. And Christmas, as I said before, to me and to us, it should be not so much a holiday, but a holy day. A, a holy day of remembrance. And I want to tell you right now, even caution you, you know, I look at a lot of TV about Christmas. I don't look at a lot of TV, but programs, everybody's got the decoration up and everybody's talking about the recipes and well, a lot of yada, 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 and you know, all those crazy shows we were looking at last night, just don't, what's Hallmark, you know, and it's, it's painful. But let me say this, don't let the spirit of the Antichrist, which is at work in our world today, to rob you of the joy of Christmas. And you're going to have to be intentional, because he is at work, that spirit is at work that wants to rob us of the truth of Christmas and thereby rob us of the joy of Christmas. And you have to be intentional. And I've been very intentional this year because I can look around society and look at TV and, and look at some homes and even sadly in some churches and see that spirit of Antichrist is at work and wants to steal Jesus away. And one way that I'm very intentional in every year, I love the music of Christmas. I enjoy the festive music. Come on, I'm not so holy. I don't, I don't have a problem with Santa Claus. Come on, I don't have a problem with the elves, you know. Okay, wrong church. <laughs> Sound all right with me. I enjoy that. But I love the worship music of Christmas. And one intentional tradition I started about four years ago was getting tickets, and I've seen none of you there, to the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra. See? Every year they do a production of Handel's Messiah. The first year I went by myself because Mona was out of town on the date. And I said, I'm going, believe it or not, I've loved classical music for a long time. I don't get many amens in this crowd. Okay. Well, Pastor Felicia, what? I, I see y'all over there. <laughs> hey, they asked me and Mona to be on the advisory council. I know, Felicia, you're on it too, right? Yeah, come on. Come on we, got, we got some culture in this house. Come on, give us a break. So... Anyway, <laughs> that means they want some money. But anyway, <laughs> I love it. And, 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 and we go every year now, and what I love about it is the Christ-centered messaging of the songs when we're Friday night. I love the, the excellence of the performance. But this was the first year that I did more extensive research on the oratorio. Many of you don't even know what that is. All of the lyrics in Handel's Messiah, every single word is Scripture and nothing but Scripture. Compiled from the books of Isaiah, Malachi, Matthew, Luke, and even the book of Revelation, every single word of lyric and all three parts and every 53 and all 53 movements. 
And this year I read the scriptures. They're written in the program. I read the scriptures written in the program as the vocalist and choir sang and, and the symphony played. And I realized no wonder this particular symphony is so powerful. No wonder that some three centuries later, Handel's Messiah is the most famous classical symphony in the world, regardless of Christmas or not. Written in 1741 by Charles Handel. Absolutely brilliant. To take the Word of God, nothing but the Word of God, and put it into a two and a half hour symphony production. I can't sing. Well, I think I can sing, but nobody else does. I certainly can't play an instrument. <laughs> but I know the power of the Word. I know the power of the Word of the Lord. So on, on this Sunday morning, seven days before Christmas, I want us together to take an intentional stand against the spirit of the Antichrist at work, even in the churches, even in my ear. And we're going to read aloud together. I'm going to read aloud, and you read with me the scriptures of Christmas. And I want you to hang in there. Anything to say, and I'm reading too much scripture, remember, it's the spirit of the Antichrist whispering in your ear. Anything that tells me, and it's told me, tried to tell me, that's too much scripture to read in a, in, a, in, a, in a Sunday morning. I said, get behind me, Satan. If I can listen to a couple of hours of word and music, I can preach a couple of hours of word in here. Well, not quite a couple of hours. But this time as we read these scriptures of Christmas, I'm going to put a bit of focus on some participants that typically don't get much attention. And so I titled this reading, The Angels of Christmas. The Angels of Christmas. Father, bless this word. The story of truth of how it all began of what is known today as Christianity, the Church of Jesus Christ, as it was first called the way. Bless your word in Jesus' name. And the church said, I'm going to read from the New Living Translation just to bring some fresh, modern, whatever to it. And so you might want to keep up on the screens. We're going to go through a bit of scripture. Is that okay with everybody? Because I know who it's not okay with. The enemy. I'm going to start in Luke 1. Luke chapter 1, verse 5 through 25 to begin. New Living Translation. When Herod was king of Judea, there was a Jewish priest named Zechariah. He was a member of the priestly order of Abijah and his wife Elizabeth was also from the priestly line of Aaron. Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous in God's eyes, careful to obey all the Lord's commandments and regulations. They had no children because Elizabeth was unable to conceive and they were both very old. One day Zechariah was serving God in the temple for his order was on duty that week. It was the custom of the priest. He was chosen by lot to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and burn incense. While the incense was being burned, a great crowd stood outside praying. And down to verse 11, while Zechariah was in the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the incense altar. Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him, but the angel said, don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. Your wife, Elizabeth, will give you a son, and you are to name him John. You will have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He must never touch wine or other alcoholic drinks. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth. And he will turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. He will be a man with the spirit and power of Elijah. He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. 
He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and he will cause those who are rebellious to accept the wisdom of the godly. Zechariah said to the angels, how can I be sure this will happen? I'm an old man, and my wife is also well along in years. Then the angel said, I'm Gabriel. I stand in the very presence of God. It was he who sent me to bring you this good news, but now since you didn't believe what I said, you will be silent and unable to speak until the child is born. For my words will certainly be fulfilled at the proper time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah to come out of the sanctuary, wondering why he was taking so long. When he finally did come out, he couldn't speak to them. Then they realized from his gestures and his silence that he must have seen a vision in the sanctuary. When Zechariah's week of service in the temple was over, he returned home. Soon after, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and went into seclusion for five months. How kind the Lord is, she exclaimed. He has taken away my disgrace of having no children. And down to verse 26, it says, In the six months of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of God, the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. And Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I am a virgin. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby will be born The baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her six months. For the Lord, the word of God will never fail. Come on, tell somebody that. The word of God will never fail. And Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. Now let's turn over to Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 through 24. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph, but before the marriage took place, While she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. And as he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. Now, let's flip back to the book of Luke, chapter 2, verse 1 through 20. At that time, the Roman emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for this census, and because Joseph was the descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. 
He took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger, because there was no lodging available for them. That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find the baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. When the angel had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished, but Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flock, glorifying and praising God for they, all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. Matthew 2. 1 through 15. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, where's the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his stars that rose and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem of Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah, for a ruler will come from you, who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. Then Herod called a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. After this interview, the wise men went their way, and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. They opened their treasure chest and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. When it was time to leave, they returned to their country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. After the wise men were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, flee to Egypt. With the child and his mother, the angel said, stay there and I tell you to return because Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. And that night, Joseph left for Egypt with the child and Mary, his mother, and they stayed there until Herod's death. This fulfilled what the Lord has spoken through the prophet. I called my son out of Egypt. And he calls us out of Egypt. Can I get an amen? Christmas is a holy day of remembrance. Somebody bring me a bottle of water, please. It's a holy day of remembrance. It's a season to celebrate the birth of our Savior. Thank you, darling. Isn't she beautiful? That's my Christmas angel. Well. I got distracted. It's a season to celebrate the birth of our Savior, but it's also to, to, to recognize the incredible way that he did it. 
When we celebrate Christmas, the first family always gets a lot of attention. There's Mary, the mother of Jesus. She gets a ton of praise, especially when I came up in the Catholic Church. She was up here and Jesus was down here. I'll leave that alone. Joseph, the earthly father, he gets an honorable mention and then strangely disappears in the story. Come on, is that night like gets lost? And then there's Uncle Zach- Zachariah and Aunt Elizabeth and cousin John the Baptist still in the oven. And then there's the shepherds and three wise men and they get their star status. And the baby Jesus is the center of attention of every nativity scene, and he should be. But before all this is revealed to the earth, Mary asked the angel. She asked the angel, how can this happen? I am a virgin. The word angel in the English Bible is translated from the Hebrew word malach and the Greek word angelos, and both mean messenger. Angels, if you do some research, they're what is known as disembodied spiritual beings. What it means is that unlike us, they are not confined to the limitations of a physical body. However, they have the ability to manifest in physical likeness of a man, and typically when they really want to get your attention, that's what they do. However, they're indistinguishable from man in appearance until they show or do something that is absolutely out of this world, and I speak from experience. Angels are created by God before man. And they were created to serve him, to worship him, to abide with him, to run errands for him, and were called upon to fight for him. And as they, like man, were created with the power to choose, they also have the power and the ability to fight against them. Revelation 12, 7 through 9 says, Then there was a war in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, Satan, and his angels. And the dragon lost the battle, and he and his angels were forced out of heaven. The great dragon, the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, the one deceiving the whole world, he was thrown down to the earth with all his angels. Come on, tell somebody, watch out! And today, in this earth, where Satan and his angels still roam for now, the good angels are messengers that God sends to remind us of eternal things. When we are experiencing the inevitable valleys of our temporary existence in this world here today, where for now, Satan rules. Hebrews 1.14 says, Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? Come on, tell somebody that's me. Y'all not convinced. In Luke 1.19, he told Zechariah, we read it, the angel said, I am Gabriel. I stand in the very presence of God. It was he who sent me to bring you this good news. What he is saying, you know, you're here on earth. And you, you're in his presence one way, but what he is saying, well, I came from like Jacob's ladder. I stand every day in the absolute presence, manifest presence of Jesus, and he sent me down the ladder to come down and give you good news. In other words, he's saying, I've got a different perspective. I've got the perspective of Christ now that you want to have one day. Can I get an amen? amen. Angels. I want you to read what I, or I'll read with me. There's a book by Michael Heiser, one of the authors I'm kind of studying. I like 99.9% of what he says. But 
Not the Bible. Can I get an amen? But it's good. It's not an angel. It's what the Bible says, what the Bible really says about God's heavenly host. And he wrote, we are children of God. There were children of God before us. Though there was no weakness or need in God like loneliness that our own creation was meant to feel, the Bible makes it clear that God wanted more children. The point is that God wants to be with his children. He wants us where he is. The plan was to blend his divine and human families on earth in difference to the limitations of human embodiment. Home is supposed to be where God is. He said, we need not fear death because we who have been granted eternal life and we will still be in God's presence after supernatural rebels have long been judged, bad angels, if we should not fear death, we should not be so distracted by the affairs of a life that is not being lived in our real home. That's a load there. Do we really believe that life in this world, as wonderful as it can be, can be compared to what has come? Do we really believe that the pain and disappointment that are inevitably part of this life in this world is where our story ends? We can mouth the right answers to both questions, but what we really believe about our future can be seen by how we live in the present. That's good. The Christmas season has a way of amplifying whatever is good or whatever is bad. It has a way of amplifying whatever the great things going on in your life or the difficult. The Christmas season has a way to bring those, th- of bringing those things in ampli- amplification. No matter, but no matter what you are going through this Christmas, even if you don't feel like it, Jesus sees you. There's all, there, are always, there's, there is always more behind the events, your life, than what you can see. Oh, we can see it easy when things are going well, but when things are seen difficult, all we see is difficult. And I get it. Pain is pain. Can I get an amen? But I'm here to tell you this morning, by the Word of God and by personal experience and men in this room, the same angels that were at work preparing people like Zechariah and Joseph and Mary and Elizabeth and kings and shepherds for the first coming of Christ are at work today preparing you for his second coming. How many in this room have ever had an encounter with an angel and you know it? I believe that most of you have, but didn't recognize the presence. And trust me, they can disguise themselves really, really well until you examine them up close. Hebrews 13, 2 says, don't forget to show hospitality to strangers. For some who have done this have entertained angels without realizing it. For many years, I worked as an usher at the door of this church and on the parking lot. And I believe at the bottom of my heart that some first-time visitors at times have been angels. He sends angels to the churches to check to see how I and you are doing his work. He wrote letters to the angels of local churches. And I've seen more than a few suspects over my years. And I'll tell you the truth, I honestly believe I saw one at the Sunday evening presbytery service. Sitting alone. I said a word. I didn't say a word. Every time I stared at him, he was staring at me. Stare back. Stranger, never seen him before. Not here today. Worshiping God. 
looking around. Had a phone. So please, church, be extra nice to that person sitting over there alone. I've had several encounters that were without a doubt angels over the last years. And I've gotten to the place where I actually watch for angels in the church. When I'm around about it, I'm, I'm watching for him. It, it, it seems that the more my life was given over to the work of the Lord, the busier angels got around me. I remember there was an angel, and you, know, you old people have heard my angel testimonies, but in the house. I remember in April 2010, I was in the woods by my house with my um, young one-year-old, a two-year-old, a Rottweiler. She was sweet, Roddy. Anybody ever met a sweet Rottweiler? She was sweet. Ella. Getting ready to go to my job at IBM and hurry up, dog. Go pee, please pee, please pee. Woods right behind my house, and I heard a booming female voice from the woods. It was so startling, I almost fell to my knees. I knew right away it was a two-word message. Don't run. Behind my house, warning me not to run a week before I would know why I would want to run from this church. And that was one about five years later that spoke to me. Again, when I, I was flying through the air with no wings, I had nothing on but jeans, a T-shirt, and a cheap beanie helmet. But the problem was when I looked over there, my Harley Davidson was flying through the air, and I wasn't on it. I heard three words again. I got you. Peace overcame in a flesh. And when I got up, there was not a scratch on my body. A bruised rib or two, a slightly crooked clavicle, clavicle the, I guess the, a little reminder of my stupidity, but not one drop of blood, not even a tear on my clothes. And then there were the, the, in, in 2013, there, there, were, there were two, on two occasions, about a week and a half apart, that, that came to both me and Mona together, sitting in a room in a hospital. I was the patient, and it was serious. Walked in separately, and we looked. Both female and both int simply introduced themselves, turned around, and started going up and down the walls praying. Now I know what the language of angel sounds like. We were stunned. And the one I remember that I want to talk about today is my Christmas angel story. Just hang in there if you're in this church. and I've said it every Christmas just about. It was Christmas Eve, 2008, 2008, and I remember it was a difficult time. I was the senior elder, and oh, at the very top, things were looking. Oof. I was mad, frustrated, and I, it was a Christmas Eve service, and I led communion, and then at the end, my, my, it was a, a gathering, a family gathering at my wife's house. I said, baby, you go ahead. I'm we were serving at a, a shelter downtown. We had been for years, and 30 men that would gather in, in that shelter. And I had bought 30 pairs of, of Christmas socks. As I'm going down, I'm, I'm going to sit with the guys downtown on Piedmont, the church basement. And I drove down there and sat with them and gave them the socks and hugged on them. And Merry Christmas. And, and then as I was leaving, I was driving home, and I was driving down um, um, Oh, I forget the name of the street. It's the four-lane street you turn off Ponce de Leon. Freedom Parkway. Yeah. It was about 11 o'clock Christmas Eve night. It was deserted. I mean, nobody out on the streets. And I see, I'm driving down the street, and I'm looking, and I see a man walk up to the edge, and 
a homeless man, and he had a sign, and it had a cup. And the sign, he just shook it like, and I, the Holy Spirit just pulled my Toyota truck over. And I pulled over to the curb and rolled down the window, and he walked up to the window and put his face in the window and didn't say a word. And when I looked in his eyes, here's one of those things. His eyes looked like the sky. I could see the clouds moving through. I was absolutely riveted. He didn't say a word. I didn't say a word. And after a while, I fumbled in my wallet. I didn't even, I, on hindsight, I know I had about $300 cash in my wallet. I didn't even look. I just took it all out, put it in the cup. He never even looked down at the cup. Stared at me. And as we stared at each other, what seemed like five minutes, I finally said, my name is Gilbert. And he said, my name is James. I mean, riveting eyes, never took his eyes off of me. And we sat there looking at each other. And, and then I, I didn't know what to say. Look, look, uh, Jesus loves you. And he looked at me and he said, I know Jesus loves me. And the way it rung in my ears, it was like that angels, I have been in the presence of God. He, he was speaking first person. As if, I know. And I remember, I, I think I just, and then I finally looked up, he was just staring at me. And then he spoke. He said, let's do this. You pray for me, and I will pray for you. And then he backed away from the window. I looked down. I looked back up. Gone. Nothing else on the street. Now, remember, I sat there on the side of the road. I don't know. It seemed like about 30 minutes. And I knew that he had come in a difficult time to simply tell me firsthand, Jesus loves me. And I'm here to tell you, secondhand, Jesus loves you. I hope to meet James one day, either on this side or the other side. But about angels, I want you to remember this morning that before Christ was king of the Jews, before he was king of kings of the earth and lord of lords of this earth, before, before Christ was even king of our hearts, he was king of the angels. And they also deserve some cred at Christmas. Can I get an amen? We read what the angel said at the birth of Christ. But look what the angel said to John after bringing the revelation of how the, the world as we know it ends. Come on. Felicia Marcus, right? In Revelation 19.10, John said, Then I fell down at his feet, the angel, to worship him. But he said, No, don't worship me. Listen to what he said. I am a servant of God just like you and your brothers and sisters who testify about their faith in Jesus. Worship only God. And then later on in, in the discourse, uh, when the same angel gave John the revelation of heaven, he gave him the revelation of, of the new city of Jerusalem, where, where man and angels, the children of God, that uh, have placed their faith in Jesus will abide in his presence forever. And it says again, just, I, John, am the one who heard and saw all these things. And when I heard them, I saw them. And again, look, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said, no, don't worship me. I am a servant of God just like you and your brothers, the prophets, as well as all who obey what is written in this book. Worship only God. And some of the final words of Jesus in the Bible. 16, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this message for 
the churches. And this is the Christmas message for us today, church. From the lyrics of Handel's Messiah, part one, twelfth movement, Isaiah 9, 6, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. I want to wish everyone a merry, Christ-filled Christmas. These next seven days, but I want to tell you right now, watch out for those Christmas angels. Come on, tell somebody, they're everywhere. Be nice to people. Be nice when you get cut off in the street. Be nice, be nice. <laughs> when they look a little rude, be nice. Angels are everywhere. Can I get an amen? Come on, y'all want to sing a song? Come on, let's stand up and sing to our King. Amen? Merry Christmas, church. I love you.